Hallo und herzlich willkommen zurück zu einer weiteren Folge Chaos at Noah. Ja, das ist jetzt der zichte Versuch, diese Folge aufzunehmen. Dadurch, dass mein eigentlicher Aufnahme-PC irgendwie aktuell enorme Probleme bereitet, musste ich ein bisschen umbasteln, nenne ich es mal. Und ich ein also mein Aufnahmesetup habe äh, erstmal kurzfristig ein klein wenig abändern, um das jetzt vernünftig aufzunehmen. Es, es nervt. Es nervt so dermaßen. Es ist. Ja. Die technischen Probleme hat man ja wahrscheinlich auch schon ein bisschen gesehen, dadurch, dass zweimal ähm, Pathfinder ausgefallen ist und äh, Shadowverse, die eine Folge ja auch komplett kaputt war. Yay. Aber nun gut. Ist jetzt nun mal so, kann ich nicht ändern. Ich hoffe, also ich habe eben eine Testaufnahme gemacht, die hat eigentlich ganz gut funktioniert, aber ich muss halt schauen, wie das jetzt ist beim vierten bzw. fünften Versuch jetzt das, allen, das aufzunehmen. Weil eigentlich hatte ich schon zwei Folgen aufgenommen. Also die diese aktuelle und die danach folgende. Nur, ist das, nur sind die beide ziemlich kaputt, weshalb ich das nicht nochmal haben wollte. Okay, that once been a certain experiment. Ah ja, stimmt ja, wir sind ja gerade äh, nach, nach dem Remy und äh, Senna sich die Auseinandersetzung miteinander hatten. Sind wir jetzt ja in der Rückblende wahrscheinlich. So, that once been a certain experiment. Ah ja, schon mal die Warnung vorweg. Das ist psychologisch nicht ohne, was jetzt passiert in dieser Folge. But it was an experiment, she had no nothing of. Das sehe ich jetzt gleich auch schon zum vierten Mal. Und es nervt langsam. She was a perfect girl in a housewife and had been blessed with a second child and a one before turning 40. No, perhaps perfectly ordinary might not have fit her quite so well. After all, her eldest daughter was already old enough to enter high school. A 15 year gap from the second child. She had been slightly worried that her, her eldest daughter and adolescent that she was would oppose the pregnancy. However, the exact opposite proved to be true. Her daughter's heart sang when she had the news. Her husband, an established scientist, often lost himself in his research and faith and rarely ever came home to his family. But when he was home, he always, had his best, he always did his best to be a good husband and father. So while she, has, she housed some dissatisfaction, she would never surpass the love she held for her husband. Her second child was delivered without issue. A healthy girl of... Uh, she named the child Mana. Soon after, her husband was unfortunately made to transfer far away. Her husband had had no capacity to support himself with even the most basic of life skills, forcing her to ask her stable daughter to go with him and tend to her father's needs. Since she, had now, since she was now living alone with the newborn Mana, they then opted to move to an affordable company housing as per her husband's plan. She had initially li been living in an apartment within the suburbs, but this made transports conven inconvenient. The new company house, however, was in the best area in Shibuya, and many of her husband's colleagues' families lived close by. Her considerate husband claimed that because of this there would be nothing to worry about in her times of need, including when she needed help with the baby. Every room in the company house was spacious and she particularly favored the bedroom. One wall was too large one wall was home to a large mirror and the opposite wall had an even larger window. From there she could view the luxurious greenery of Yorogi Park. She then went on to quickly befriend a housewife living close by and received extraordinary treatment from the company, namely being provided house a housekeeper. She was proud of husband for holding such an important position within this, co within this company, one that allowed her to live in such luxurious ways, and so her life without worries nor, dis nor dissatisfaction continued. Two years passed, when Mana had experienced the late growth, she had grown into a healthy child, already not contracting any major illnesses. She was a very pampered child. If she did not create a man on her arms, the girl would start crying in a voice so shrill, It could shatter even the thickest glass. Regrettably, she had fallen ill about a month prior. A particularly grave symptom was a fierce tinnitus, something she suffered from throughout the most hours of the day. 
fortunately for her, the housekeeper and the housewife next door were more than willing to assist her with taking care of Mana. Regardless of the help she received, she was essentially joined at sleep with Mana and was never able to part from her even for a moment. Even when going to the bathroom, even when taking a bath, if a thought were even to cross her mind about having the housekeeper created the baby for a short time, Mana would detect these intentions and immediately burst into tears. Contrary to what one might surmise, she actually found endeavored in how much Mana clung to her. But due to the inseparability of the two, she continued to live a life where she could never take even a single step outside of her own home. Her lifestyle was entirely supported by the housekeeper and the housewife. For her meeting, the two had become her true saving grace. However, over time, something odd began to happen with the two helpers. During a friendly chat in the living room that had occurred a week prior, the housewife had spontaneously vomited without warning, paying no heed to the confusion. She showed no the housewife then and rushed outside. She had not seen her since, leaving her to worry that she had perhaps fallen ill. Concerned, she decided to ask the housekeeper if she could check on her. As the housekeeper left that day, she made her request, concluding in with an I would love your help tomorrow as well, dear. And yet when the housekeeper heard these words, she suddenly burst into tears and could only nod again and again as she departed. The teenagers that had been tormenting her so became so became fiercer that night, to the point where it felt as soon as her head itself might split apart. She tried calling an ambulance, but the line refused to connect. She then tried going outside to ask the neighboring housewife for help, but even that proved too much for her. Throughout all of this, her daughter had continued to cry in incessantly, further agitating her pain. In order to endure this terrible pain, she embraced her beloved Mana, and as she did so, both the tinnitus and the crying abruptly stopped. The pain in her head vanished, yet just as suddenly, almost as if, as if it had never been there to begin with. She then looked down only to see that the child she was holding was now a mummified corpse. In spite of how heavily it had been crying until that very moment, the body had only so that body had suddenly become the body had suddenly become a des desiccated rotting mound of flesh, one that gave off the most repulsive stench. And so, before she could ever realize it was all an experiment, her mind broke. There had once been a certain experiment, but it was an experiment that went different to how he had hypothesized. He was a scientist at Nozomi Technology, a follower of the cosmic church of the divine light, the man at the center of Nozomi's strictly confidential project Noah, and the man that had deciphered Fan hoch 10 mal intelligence for 40 like IR2. He had offered his wife on the verge of childbirth as a test subject for the experiment. With that had been, while that had been an instruction from the founder that he revered, it had been just as much his own su suggestion, all to ensure the success of the experiment. It was crushed in the mana experiment, after the code name given to the second daughter. His eldest daughter of fifteen was placed in the cosmic church of divine of the divine light institution. All while he observed his confined wife and infant child for 24 hours a day. His wife had been led to believe that the place he resided in was a company house, but in reality it was a test site that Nozomi Technology had prepared, a site containing the Noah 2 prototype he was developing. Mind reading visual projection and control over the five senses in order to research the effects of such practices, he looked like he locked his wife and daughter, Mana, into the site as a test subject. Not much was known about the effects of electromagnetic radiation on the human body, so he very much intended to halt the experiment immediately if his wife or child showed any strange abnormalities. The experiment was then met with an unfortunate accident soon after it began. Mana passed away at one month of age, her cause of death unknown. It was an accident nobody could have prevented. He was overcome with sorrow and attempted to bring the experiment to a close, and yet such a thing was not permitted to him. Those were the words of his employer. 
His employer was referring to the bizarre sight visible within the experiment. His wife did not seem to recognize Mana's death as real, and instead treated her remains as if mm, he was still her child. In her eyes, Mana had never died, but in truth, these things were all a simple projection, a reality only she was privy to. This was an effect of the Noah 2 prototype, and in a certain sense, the situation provided an optimal optic opportunity to test its capabilities. Consequently, he had to switch with disregarded. Eventually, even he came to think that continuing the experiment would be best for his wife's sake. Looking upon the one way mirror, his wife m would embrace the corpse of their child and lift her every day in blissful happiness. She would gaze through the window towards the greenery of Yuri Park, but in reality, the window was a mere paper wallpaper and the scenery a projection, and yet, the simple sm and yet she simply smiled at the, at the view. Alright, gently tending to her child as she called. Steph, belonging to the research team, would take care of his wife, with one playing the role of na a neighboring housewife and the other of a, ho a housekeeper. As long as the experiment continued, her mind would never break, as Shatsi told himself that this was all for his wife's sake. Though, in truth, perhaps his mind had broken far beyond his wife's ever could. At some point in time, his goal had changed from completing Noah 2 to forcing his wife to continue living an endless dream. After continuing the experiment for two years, his employer suddenly announced an end to the job, to the project. He vehemently opposed this, his desperation evident, and yet his, this passion had him branded a traitor, and he was subsequently removed from the project. As a gesture of kindness, he was permitted to be present at the test site on the final day of the experiment, albeit within restraints. And with him, his daughter, of whom he had not seen across in those full two years, was forced to be present. A look of bewilderment was to her face when she noticed him. He was unable to answer. His guilt over what he had done preventing him from looking his daughter in the eye. Meanwhile, the start of a ghastly ritual was drawing near. The housewife had long since become unable to endure Mana's rotting stench, and the housekeeper had left the test set in tears in response to his wife's words. And then the equipment was stopped. The dream ended, and his wife broke in her eyes. What was once a child had suddenly transformed into a mummy, a sight that brought her to a scratch at her scalp, tear out her hair, dig her fingernails into the flesh of her face, and then... ...begin to ravenous devour the desiccated body of her own child. Through every tear of flesh, she continued to laugh maniacally, bang her head against the wall, before eventually she took a kitchen knife, drove the blade into her own eyes and died right there, right where she stood. The daughter cried and screamed as she watched her mother's horrific end from beyond the one-way mirror. Na lecker. Das war das Mittagessen. Oder Frühstück. His daughter was then taken away by two researchers, with one taking hold of each arm. He was not even granted the opportunity to pursue his only remaining relative. He blamed himself for everything, believing he had re reaped what he himself had sowed. Regardless of his reasons, when he had resolved to continue the experiment two years ago, it had been obvious how things would end. Mere days after being witness to his wife's death, he vanished, and now Nary or so knew of his current whereabouts. Ich habe gesagt, das ist psychologisch nicht so ohne, was da was in dieser Folge passiert. Man kann irgendwie nachvollziehen, dass Senna leicht pisst ist. <laughs> after, every, uh, after everything had settled, Senna had gone on to interrogate Kozopi about something with bloodshot eyes. 
Und dann, after doing that for a bit, she ran off somewhere on her own. Wir sind jetzt bei Taku. Could appear chess after her, but I, meanwhile, had just been staying put. Still incredibly f confused as to why Sin had become so obsessive all of a sudden. And now I was touching to Shimo, Shimo Kitazawa. My parents' house was only a short distance away. Walking from my base to it took less than half an hour. Could Nanami be there? So not as busy as she were itself, the road of Shimo Kitazawa were fairly crowded. I was still being hit by the aftermath of that ass by debacle. Namely, some passersby looked at me with mocking sneers, while others even took pictures of me on their phones. Overwhelmed by embarrassment and humiliation, I hurried along the road to home. Come in. Rumi's eyes were pointed to the ground as she said that. She was walking a bit behind me, and in the time we had spent moving along, she had, she had, repeated, she had already repeated those words over ten times. Come no matter how much she apologized, I had no way of answering. I didn't know anything about Rimi. Nothing had changed ever, shin ever since we had first met. And yet she supported me. She stayed by my side. But at the end of the day, there was still so much I didn't know about her. Even so, I'd always brushed the issue out of my mind. Perhaps it was because something I in me knew that she wouldn't stay with me if I knew the truth. And that terrified me. I worked up the courage and asked her what was on my mind. I asked her the reason why she would stay with a guy like me. Was it because she was trying to lure me into a trap the entire time, just like you I had? And yet despite my suspicions, the answer she gave was nothing of the sort. Didn't want me to awaken, like a, as a gigalomaniac? We knew more about me than I did. Rumi hesitated a little. Mm. In other words, she was telling me to stop pushing. But there was no way I could stop her. <laughs> Which was it? Was she trying to dodge the question? No, actually, she had the question very accurately answered. You knew about IR2? I've heard of it. She didn't say from who. Lies. Telling me it was all lies. Was a lie in, in and of itself. I could tell just from looking at her. I was about to ask more, but I had my tongue. Are you my enemy? Are you my friend? Depending on the answer, I might not even... I might not have been able to stay with Rimi, so I didn't ask. If I pretended that nothing had happened, I could keep on deceiving myself, just as I had been up until now. That way might be easier for me, happier even. Okay, then... W okay, that was what I was gonna do. I was gonna keep being ignorant and keep living a lie. A lie told by Rimi. Rimi had saved my ass so many times already, so, the so there was no way any harm would come to me if I did that. I deserved to live in a normal life, just like she had said. I averted my eyes from her and swept out my question for a few words of gratitude. I couldn't think of anything else to say, uh, so I just continued walking toward my parents' house in silence. My eyes were eventually met with a familiar alleyway. It was a quite secluded residential area. Every now and then I could hear the faint sound of a train in the distance. I had known the specific chunk of, chin of scenery ever since I was a little kid. This was where I had grown up. I had walked to both elementary school and middle school using this alleyway. If I had through the narrow alleyway in front of me, my house would be right there. I was scared of seeing Nanami again, 
but I had to know for certain whether her arm was still there. I stopped and took a deep breath to calm myself, and then, right when I was about to start walking again, Mate. I turned around to see Rimi on the verge of tears. What was that supposed to do? ずっと一緒にいるから。それで一緒に学校に行って第一と三人で他愛もない話をして帰りに立ち食いそば屋さんとか心理ショップとかに寄って。そうやってこれからもやっていこうよ。ぼ、僕は七海に会わなくちゃ
yeah, my rule. What should have been a familiar place felt like I was setting foot in in it for the first time. Show me beauty. Rumi stood right behind me. She had denied my words immediately. Yup. The sunset illuminated the long corridor of the hospital. The lights were not turned on in this short period before nightfall rendering it fairly dim. The clamor of dinner time from beyond had calmed and an eerie silence descended in its place. Shogun was slowly traveling down the corridor in, which in his wheelchair. The creaking of the, reach of the wheels echoed throughout the empty hall. Many nurses passed him by, but none spoke to him, nor even so much as glanced his way. Acting as though this was perfectly normal, Shogun continued to spin the wheels with a sense, emaciated skin and bone as they were. <laughs> when he passed in front of one of the rooms, a male patient known as Yamai called out to him. He pointed at him with his index finger, sounding <laughs> frantically. It's Amichan. Yeah. Together with Yamai, the nurse had a face of complete befuddlement. <laughs> The nurse looked around, then looked at the man with a first smile on her face. Despite the fact that children was passing through the corridor right before her very eyes, the nurse spoke as if there was no one there at all. Da fehlt nur noch ein Buchstabe. Yamai became increasing, increasingly worked up as he continued to cry out. Shogun simply ignored him and suddenly turned right at the end of the hallway. The wall which had been cream colored up until that very moment suddenly changed to black. And yet even though that wall stood right in front of him, Shogun did not hold his wheelchair. Right before he was about to collide with it, the black wall suddenly vanished. It quite literally had vanished. After the wall disappeared, a hidden corridor appeared from beyond its past rain. Shogun continued straight through it. He traveled another 20 meters before finally reaching a true dead end. At that dead end was a lone door to a hospital room. Shogun opened the door and headed inside. It was the Phantom Hospital Room, the ghost story whispered about for many years, the tale of a room nobody knew of. And the person hospitalized within it, the name written upon the nameplate was Nisi Jo Takumi. Damit haben wir jetzt einen Nisijo Takumi, der offenbar seine Vergangenheit verloren hat, beziehungsweise äh, zumindest sein Haus verloren hat und ein Nisijo Takumi, der offenbar Shogun ist. Vielen Dank fürs Zuschauen und bis zum nächsten Mal. Ciao.